Mike Hall here. What's going on, guys? Zach Center. Uh, hey, how's it going, Dog Brown fans? Here in Berea right now. Excited to be a Cleveland Brown right now. Yeah, man. Just excited to meet all you guys in Cleveland. Happy to be here. Yes, sir. Welcome to the Dogs Podcast with your hosts, Blake Reniker, Justin Charles, and Josh All. What's up, Browns fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Dogs Podcast presented by Omaha Steaks. Josh All alone with you guys on Sunday, wrapping up NFL Draft Weekend, the weekend we've been waiting for for so long. We've been detailing so much about the draft, so many prospect profiles, So much scouting, so much research has gone into everything we've done in all the episodes coming up to this weekend, and it's all in the books. We have got the answers. We know who the new Cleveland Browns are moving in to 2024. Today, I'm going to break down each of the Browns' six draft picks from the 2024 NFL Draft this weekend, everything from Friday night through Saturday night, and I will be touching upon the UDFA signings that Andrew Barry has made since the draft ended, but I will do a separate episode later this week because we might sign a few more UDFAs during the week. I'm not sure what's going to happen yet. We've got a handful already, guys I'm really excited about, and uh, yeah, I will, I'll do a separate episode later this week breaking down each of the UDFA prospects to give you guys some more information on them, but when you take this draft class... And I don't mean to get too far ahead of myself here into the episode, but when you take the draft class mixed with the UDFA class, the, the every rookie that the Browns have acquired over the weekend, I personally think this might be my favorite rookie class that Andrew Barry has brought into the building in Berea. I'll break it all down for you guys. We'll go player by player and look at each of these prospects and everything so that way you get to learn more about who the new Cleveland Browns are, but I got to tell you guys, if if you're if you went through the weekend, if you went through that draft thinking, okay, this is just kind of ho hum for the Browns, it's kind of meh. We didn't trade up, we didn't trade back, we just sat at our at the six spots that we had, with two seventh round picks being two of those six those six spots. We just stayed pat. We just picked. We we sticked and picked. And if you are of that mindset that eh, it wasn't anything overly exciting. Bear with me on this episode. I'm going to do my best to convince you otherwise. I think that, spoiler, but I think the Browns have at least four out of the six picks who could turn into stalwart slash starter type players for the Cleveland Browns in the future. So stay with me through this episode. It's going to be a ton of fun. I can't wait to break down each of these players. If you guys were with us on Friday night when we were doing the live coverage of day two, man, was that a good time. It was so much fun. Kenny Mack, DF Sports, Devontae Travis, thank you guys so much for coming to the studio and helping us through the draft night live coverage. It was a ton of fun. We had a good time. There's, I split the entire night into four different episodes because it was almost four hours, three and a half hours or so of a live stream. Broke it into four different sections for you guys to go back and reconsume on YouTube if you would like to and just Cannot emphasize enough how appreciative we are of all of you guys, the listeners, the viewers, tuning in to that episode, to that live coverage, and and hanging out in the chat, and having a ton of fun, and helping us really destroy all those trolls that just started bouncing in and out because they apparently had nothing better to do than to come troll the Cleveland Browns and our show, which we always appreciate. We welcome your trolldom because you're pretty easy to dismantle. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort on our part, and it's a ton of fun. So thank you guys for all of that. And before I dive in to the first prospect here that the Browns took on Friday night, let me just remind you guys, please like this video, subscribe to the channel on YouTube. We are pushing to 10,000 subscribers, and the faster we get there, the happier we're going to be because we are going to do some sort of giveaway when we hit 10,000 subscribers. Haven't decided exactly what it's going to be, probably a jersey of some type. But you want to make sure you help us get there because you will be involved in some way in that contest. So stay tuned for those details as we get closer to 10,000 subscribers. And lastly, if you're listening on audio, Apple Podcasts, please do us a big solid scroll down to the bottom of the page and tap five-star review. Leave us a written five-star review that really helps out the show. 
It's a no cost way to you to help us continue to get our podcast in front of more Browns fans like you guys. So if you like the show and you want other Browns fans to hear it, please leave us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts. So again, we're about to kick this off. But like I said at the top of the show, if you come out of this episode and you're still not excited about this draft class or you still think, meh, not not so much to be you know interested in here or whatever the case may, may be, please post it in the comments. Drop it in the comments. You guys know that we love engaging with everybody in the comments. Yes, if, if you're going to be a snarky, smart-ass fan, we'll call it, or just a troll in the comments, we are going to give it right back to you in full fashion. But if you've got genuine takes and you're like, hey, listen, I see what you guys are saying about so-and-so, but I still feel like this or that or the other, we love having those conversations with you guys. That kind of conversation dialogue is what got Devontae Travis into the dog pack at jointhedogs.com to become an official dog pack member. And then eventually got him onto an episode with us. Just the football knowledge, the back and forth talk that we had, the discussions we had on just the YouTube comments. And now you see that he was with us on Friday night doing the live show. So it was a ton of fun. It's a great way to interact with us in the comments. And again, I, I just mentioned it. Join the dogs.com if you want more of our content and to be part of the dog pack community. It's an awesome place to be. So let's kick things off. So the Browns sat Pat again at every spot in the draft, and it all started with sticking right at 54 in the second round, and we got there, and the first player the Browns took, and this is going to be kind of a theme for some of these players throughout the show, but it is a player that we mocked to the Browns in a few of our mock drafts. It's a guy the Browns met with a couple different times. They had their sights set on him, and it just felt like the Browns had sincere, genuine interest in selecting Michael Hall Jr., the defensive tackle from Ohio State. Yes, that's right. Buckeye Nation, we get another Buckeye added to this team, which I always freaking love to do. So with Michael Hall, as we go through this, I mentioned this Friday night, yes, interior defensive lineman, defensive tackle is the listed position, but let's think of Michael Hall more as defensive line in general. Because Michael Hall will most likely be utilized across the entire defensive line, outside, inside, what have you. I don't think he's going to be restricted exclusively on the interior. Now, that's going to be primary, I'm sure, but he is a versatile athlete. So let's break in or let's break down Michael Hall Jr. So he's six foot three, 290 pounds, and he is just 20 years old. So a young prospect, Andrew Barry, gets his guy. And he, the thing with Michael Hall is he's played a lot of college snaps, but he's only 20 years old. So you know that this guy was able to dominate opposing offensive linemen in a major conference at a major program at a young age. So that's a really, really good sign for his future production in the NFL. Michael Hall is from Streetsboro, Ohio, so he's a hometown kid. The Browns brought him back home to Cleveland. He is excited to be here. You guys heard him in the open at the beginning of the show. And he spent two years as a starter at Ohio State. He earned two-time, uh, he was named two-time third-team All-Big Ten, so not second or first team, but still, you know, as a defensive interior guy in the Big Ten, not a lot of pass rush stats and things like that are really coming from the interior D-line, I would imagine. At, co at the college level. So he's still getting, you know, third team, all big 10 honors. 2022, he had just seven hurries, but he did have five sacks on the season. And just now in 2023, his sacks went down to one and just one and a half sacks on the season. But his uh, quarterback hurries went from seven to 22. So he really increased his pressure rate against the quarterback. In 2023, however, now this is the big one that I, I was looking for. I went searching for this stat because I thought, and I didn't know the stat ahead of time, but I thought this, this, I'm sure this stat is pretty high for Mike Hall. And it was Michael Hall had the second highest pass rush win rate among all defensive tackles in the entire nation, 18.2%. Now, yes, I know some people out there, I know how haters and you guys, some of you guys feel about pass rush win rate, but if you're listening to this show and you don't like that stat, I am sorry. I am very, very sorry to tell you the NFL loves that stat. The NFL is very big on pass rush win rate because the NFL, like us, we understand that 
Just because you're rushing the passer does not mean it's always going to result in a sack. It's not always going to result in a QB hit. It's not always going to result in something that you can pull up a box score and say, yes, this guy led the team in this stat or this stat because an ESPN box score has like four categories to look at. That's it. Pass rush win rate. I'm telling you, this this shows how effective a player is at impacting the quarterback, impacting an offensive play. And Mike Hall, second highest pass rush win rate in the entire nation, 18.2%. Dude gets after the quarterback just because, again, we talk about this with Miles. And if you, you know if you don't like this stat, I don't know what to tell you. We're going to keep talking about it because it freaking matters. Just because you don't put the quarterback on his back, or maybe you do, but he's already gotten rid of the ball. So it doesn't count as a sack, so it doesn't go in the in the box score. You are affecting that play. You, you might be making the quarterback ditch the ball, throw it away, dirt the ball, something. Who knows what your your win, your pass rush win is leading to, but I would say 99.9% of the time it leads to something positive. So keep that in mind as we go through some of this as well. Now, again, all these prospects are going to have pros and they're all going to have cons. Every prospect, every player who's ever come in the NFL has those. Michael Hall, not the best run defender, He's undersized. He is not a, he's not Siaki Ika. He's not 375 pounds or whatever Ika came in as last year. He's 290. He's slight. He's slimmer. He's leaner. The dude has athleticism. He's explosive, but he's not the best run defender. That's not his game. So uh, I, I've used draft uh, NFL draft prospect profiles for a lot of this information I'm going to give you guys today. And we're going to be talking from Draft Buzz Scouting, which is another scouting resource that I really, really do like. So draft buzz scouting rated Michael Hall uh, 77% against the run, which isn't bad. I mean, 77, yeah, okay. Again, he's not a run defender, so you kind of expect that. But they gave him a 93% grade in pass rush. That is very high, and that is exactly why the Browns used their second-round pick on Mike Hall Jr. So as I mentioned, from his NFL draft prospect profile, his production score was just a 64, 14th overall at the defensive tackle position. And that goes back to the stats I listed earlier. Not a lot of counting stats, not a lot of tackles, not a lot of sacks this year in 2023, but his athleticism score was up at 86. That was third best among all the defensive tackles in this draft class. He is the sixth overall ranked defensive tackle. The Browns get him down at 54. I thought that was great value. They say he's uh, twitchy to knock blockers off balance. He's got sudden feet and active hands to whip guards. Immediate sub rush potential as a three technique and a one gap scheme. Pros about Mike Hall. He was dominant against senior bowl competition. Corkscrews post leg into the ground for added double team anchor. Impressive ability to absorb contact and play off the block. Beats single blocks with slide step and arm over move. Attacks one edge while setting up counter to the other in his rush. And active hands and short area quickness bring pressure to the pocket. That's what the Browns are looking for. Now, the weaknesses for Mike Hall. Undersized inside, could wear down against larger NFL-sized offensive linemen. He works overtime to neutralize a block, but struggles to shed it. Gives early ground to inline power in the run game. Again, run defense, not his not his strength. Lower body tightness prohibits sharp cornering at the top of his rush and knocked off the rush path by firm punch or redirections. So like I said, you take the pros with the cons with a lot of these prospects. Nobody's going to have a perfect profile. But if you look at Draft Buzz scouting summary for Michael Hall, his trajectory at Ohio State underlines a defender on the rise, bringing to the table an intriguing mix of quickness, power, and technique. His ability to explode off the snap and disrupt plays in the backfield has made him a re- sorry has made him a nuisance for offensive lines, showcasing the high motor and pass rush versatility coveted by NFL teams. His developmental arc, however, isn't without its hurdles. His tweener size and occasional lapses in block recognition signal a need for a tailored role at the next level, potentially as a three technique in a 4-3 scheme or an interior presence in a hybrid defense. Questions about his endurance and consistency against the run must be addressed, ensuring he can sustain performance levels through the grind of an NFL season. As pro teams dive deeper into Hall's tape, they'll find a player with the foundational traits of an impact defender. Quick hands agile movement, and the relentless pursuit of the quarterback. Paul will be to harness these attributes consistently, enhancing his technique and situational awareness. If he can navigate these adjustments, Hall's transition to the NFL promises not just a roster spot, but a significant rotational role with the potential 
to develop into a cornerstone defensive lineman. So the range of outcomes is pretty big for Mike Hall, but the Browns look at that and they say, we think we can get the most out of this kid. And that's why they used a second round pick to get him. So overall, I'm very excited to have Mike Hall, not just because he's a Buckeye. Yes, am I an Ohio State Buckeye homer? It's my alma mater. Of course I am. I love me some Buckeyes. But, it, you know, Tommy Togi, I wasn't pounding the table to keep him on the team just because he went to Ohio State. You've got to perform. Okay, I love where he came from. I love what he's projected to be able to do at the NFL. And the fact that the Browns have Jim Schwartz as defensive coordinator, you bring a talent like this onto a Jim Schwartz defensive line, look TF out. This kid, I believe, is going to be pretty damn good for the Browns. Maybe not this year because we talked about it on uh, the live show Friday. The Browns are pretty much set. They're stacked at the defensive interior. And as we go through the prospects here, the Browns drafted, we took another defensive tackle at the end of the draft. So we'll get to him. But the fact is the Browns never feel like they have enough or, you know, they, they just continue to strive for quality depth on the defensive line. And that's exactly what they attacked here in the draft. And they, it's, that's exactly what they got. And the two defensive tackles they got are very opposite of each other and what they bring to the table. So again, strategic, intentional, very good moves by the Browns. And overall, very happy with the selection of Michael Hall at pick 54. This episode is presented by Omaha Steaks. Browns fans, I don't know where you're at. It may or may not feel like it, but it is spring. And the Omaha Steaks spring sale is here. And it is the perfect time to get fired up for all your spring time grilling. 50% off site wide. These are the sales that I love to take advantage of because it's the perfect time to grab everything from Omaha Steaks at half the price. And when you use promo code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, when you check out, you get an additional $30 off your order. It's a deal that you just can't pass up. So head over to omahasteaks.com slash dogs right now. Order the perfectly aged tender steaks, ocean fresh seafood, juicy burgers, incredible air chilled chicken, and all their delicious desserts, ready to eat meals, all this stuff. They've, they've got appetizers and stuff too, guys chicken wings and mott sticks and everything you could possibly want to stock up for a fantastic spring grilling season. 50% off site wide, omahasteaks.com slash dogs. Use promo code dogs, D-A-W-G-S when you check out for $30 off your order. Minimum order may be required. Before we move on, Ohio, Bet365 is offering new users $150 in bonus bets this month. To receive your bonus bets, all you have to do is sign up for Bet365 using our link, make a first deposit of $10, and place a $5 wager on any game. Once that first $5 bet settles, you will receive $150 in bonus bets, even if you lose the bet. To be eligible for this sign-up bonus, you must sign up through our link down in the description. So if you haven't yet signed up for Bet365, click our link in the description and place that first bet. This offer is only available for new customers who are 21 and older and physically present in Ohio. Please gamble responsibly. If you or a loved one has a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Check the episode description for the full terms to see if you can qualify. Next, third round, pick 85. Cleveland Browns are on the clock, and they walk up and they select offensive guard Zach Zinter from <laughs> Michigan. Boo! Boo. No, I'm just messing. Zach, I know you're from Michigan, but you are now a Cleveland Brown, so we don't care about the Michigan thing anymore. Thought it was actually pretty neat. DF was talking about this Friday night that the Browns went Ohio State Buckeye and Michigan Wolverine back-to-back on Friday night, and having those two come into Cleveland together, having those two on the video that you saw, you know, the, hey, Cleveland, we're here video at the beginning of the show— it's just kind of cool. You know, it's cool to see these, you know, you know, these two hated each other in college because of, of where they played. And now all those feelings, they're out the door because they're both in Cleveland as Browns. And I just think it's a really cool thing. And, you know, there's another connection here with these two a little bit later as I read that, uh, you know, we did mention on Friday night, but it's just, it just increases the interest here. But Zach Zinter, again, went into this uh, draft Friday night me and Justin talked a lot leading into even pick 54. Like, we need to address offensive line. I'm sorry. We have got to. There were a couple of tackles we liked on the board. And while, you know, we do have Conklin, Jones, Wills. Next year, the other tackle across from uh, Dewan Jones is going to be. We're not really sure what that's going to be yet. 
But offensive interior line, we really need depth there. We really need to start planning for the future. Joel Batonio is 33. He's got one year left after this, I believe. Who knows if he's going to retire or maybe he'll play till he's 38. I don't know. But he's probably, well, I shouldn't say probably. He's definitely closer to retiring than he's not. And then Wyatt Teller at the other guard, which is where Zach Zinter plays, right guard. Wyatt Teller is phenomenal. We love him. He's a Cleveland Brown, one of our favorites. He's, I've talked about this whenever I did the um, State of the Brown series, got to the offensive line. His contract is one that the Browns could look to move on from to save space against the cap, either this year or next year. So Zach Zinter, I think, is that future plan for that. But I really like this pick because, again, we were advocating for offensive line, kind of preferred interior. I was a big Cooper BB guy, maybe at pick 54, something like that. But we get Zach Zinter at pick 85. And just like I was talking about with Mike Hall, I love this pick. I think the value is off the charts for where the Browns were able to get him and what he can potentially be for us in the future. So Zach Zinter, six foot six, 309 pounds. That's a big offensive guard. He just turned 23 years old like two weeks ago. So he's a little older in the prospect age range that Andrew Bear usually shoots for. But again, this is another common theme we're going to see as I go through these guys. And that COVID year in 2020, you know, added another year of eligibility for a lot of guys. A lot of teams missed out on that whole season altogether. So we are seeing older prospects. And I do believe this is the final year for that impact. But anyway, so Zach Zinter is from Port St. Lucie, Florida. And he started as a true freshman for Michigan back in 2020. He was named second team all Big Ten then the following year in 2021. And then he was named first team all Big Ten in 2022 and 2023. Not only that, he was voted a unanimous All-American in 2023. So Zach Zinter, a four-year starter at Michigan, one of the you know, you can call it premier. I know I'm a Buckeye fan, but premier programs in the nation, Big Ten Conference. They just won a national championship. Very good coach team, Jim Harbaugh, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. But the, the dude has accolades. He's got recognitions. He was a an anchor, a leader on that offensive line for the Michigan Wolverines. Against Ohio State, this is that last connection I was talking about. Against Ohio State, Going against Michael Hall and the uh, Buckeyes defensive line just a few months ago in 2023, Zinter broke his tibia and his fibula. He got carted off the field. He had to miss the college football playoffs. He had to miss, miss the national championship game. But that the, the injury for him is something that obviously the Browns aren't concerned with. I'm not concerned with because, again, at this moment in time, we're not expecting him to start. I uh, hope to God we don't even have to have him play any sort of meaningful snaps this year because that means Batonio and Teller stayed healthy. Take this whole year to you know acclimate yourself to the NFL, to the new level of, now this is professional football, not college football, the training regimen, everything that's different between college and pro. Learn how to be a pro, follow in these guys' footsteps, continue to heal, get that leg strong, and come back next year. I like the potential here. So Zach Zinter, a four-year starter, allowed just three sacks total the last three seasons, and that includes zero in 2023 with just five pressures allowed on 296 pass box snaps. Very impressive. Hmm. Kind of reminds me of some of the stat numbers we were looking at with Dewan Jones and Luke Whipler last year. Played every single snap at call in college at right guard, like I said, the wide teller role. NFL draft prospect profile. Pros about Zach Zinter. Broad across his upper body with thick hips and adequate length. Takes smart angles and lands on linebackers as a second level climber. Diligent finding positioning and feet before striking for improved balance. Stays secure into the block with strong hands and driven feet. Able to hold his ground against bull rushers. Does a nice job of resetting hands to maintain positioning when mirroring. Weaknesses. Coming back from broken tibia and fibula suffered in late November. Already mentioned that. Two gappers can punch and separate from him. Average momentum into drive blocks off the snap. Below average short area quickness and pass production protection. Could have trouble making successful recoveries when beaten. I think it's important to remind everybody that, well, like I said before, yes, pros and cons with every prospect, but you got a guy like this in the third round. 
I, I don't understand. I do see some of this online, maybe not a ton, but why are we taking, you know, backup offensive guard? This isn't backup offensive guard. This is future starter. Zach Zinter will be a starting offensive guard for the Cleveland Browns in the future. I'm telling you guys, because you look at a guy like Wyatt Teller, is he one of the best offensive guards in the entire NFL? Yes. He was drafted in the fifth round. The Buffalo Bills didn't even want him. They traded him to us. So there, there is great value, great talent to be had later in the drafts. We have to get away from the mindset of first and second round picks are these you know, all pro, pro bowl caliber type players all the time. And then, you know, third and fourth, maybe you get lucky. Anything after that is just, you know, a throwaway pick. That's not the case. You can get quality starting players all throughout the draft. And Zach Zinter in the third round is exactly that. So if we go over to draft buzz, his scouting summary, Zach Zinter's tenure at Michigan showcased his ability to dominate in the trenches, underlined by his role in propelling the Wolverines run game to new heights his knack for anchoring against powerful bull rushes, and his prowess in executing second-level blocks make him a very solid prospect. Despite concerns about his recovery from a severe leg injury, his tape reveals a player with the foundational skills to start at the next level, capable of holding his own as both a run blocker and pass protector. However, Zenter's transition to the NFL won't be without its challenges. His performance against speed rushers and in space raises questions about his fit in schemes requiring high levels of mobility and quickness. These limitations, coupled with the recent injury setback, could impact his draft stock and early career development. Teams will weigh these factors against his proven track record of reliability, leadership, and technical proficiency. Zinter's ability to adapt to the faster pace and complex defensive schemes of the NFL will be critical in determining his success and longevity in the league. I We talked about this Friday night. I think Zach Zinter probably would have been a surefire second round pick had it not been for the injury. Really, really do. First round, probably not. I don't think a whole lot of guards were really bouncing off the board. It was more tackles in the first round. Second round, yes. Late third round where the Browns got him, I don't think that would have been possible without the injury. So the Browns take advantage of a, a situation to bring a guy in and give him the opportunity to continue to heal and recover from that injury while he's learning all the things that this this profile just talked about. I think bringing him, him in with Dickerson and Isvan on the uh, offensive line, and you get him with a future Hall of Famer and Joel Batonio, you get him with Wyatt Teller, Jack Conklin, these, these seasoned pro veteran guys who know how to play offensive line at the NFL level, wheels up for Zach Center. I think we've got right there, because I said before the show, I think we got four out of the six draft picks as – I can easily see how they're future starters or at least, you know, strong role players for the Browns. Right there's two of the four in Mike Hall and Zach Zenter. Uh, real quick, had to do a quick cut back in here as I'm going back through editing. Totally forgot I had the clip of Andrew Barry calling Zach Zenter to tell him the Browns are going to draft him. And I saw this video on Twitter and I, you know, I had no intention of putting it in the episode, but oh my gosh. Just Andrew Barry's awesome is really all this clip tells me is Andrew Barry's awesome. And this is why like guys like him and Kevin Stefanski have such a good rapport with the team and the players because they just know how to relate to these guys. So just listen to the clip from AB when he calls Zach Zinter to tell him that the Browns are about to draft him and bring him to Cleveland. All right. You, you want you want to come off the board here? I would love to. Okay. Well, here. It, it, okay. Whether I take you off the board, it depends on how you answer this question. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Can you block Michael Hall? <laughs> All right, we'll make you a Cleveland Brown then. Yeah. So, listen, we're, we're, we're excited to get you here, man. Uh, you know, you, you, you've been a target of ours for some time now, so we're really excited to get you going in this O line room, and um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to a nice long career in Cleveland. All right. Me too. Thank you so much. I'm ready to go. So I just thought that was hilarious. I mean, he he calls the Michigan Wolverine and says, "Hey." You want to come off the board? You got to answer one question. Can you block the Ohio State Buckeye I just drafted? I mean, the the humor, the joking, the understanding that I know you guys have this rivalry, but now we are all Browns, and I just want everybody to know that we're working together here to achieve something great. Andrew Barry does phenomenal stuff, and I just love seeing the personal side of him like that, and I just thought that was kind of fun. So then we cover the huge gap from pick 85 to pick 156 where – I felt if the Browns were going to make a trade, it was going to be to acquire a pick somewhere in that range because they missed the entire fourth round. There were a ton of prospects that I really liked that I was really high on that I thought would fit the Browns really well 
in that range. And they, a lot of them flew off the board as we sat back and waited at 156, didn't make a move. We stayed there. And as we were leading into pick 156, there was a name on the board that I was like, oh, please, Father God in heaven above us, let this name fall to the Browns. Jeremiah Trotter Jr. was sitting there. Oh, man, if we could have landed JTJ at pick 156, unreal value. And I just have a, my gut tells me that's what the Browns are eyeing and they were going to let him fall to them because the Philadelphia Eagles jumped the Browns, traded up to get right in front of us, right to pick 155, just so they could run up to the, the podium and select Jeremiah Trotter Jr. So the Philadelphia Eagles took Trotter right before we could. I'd say they snaked him from us, but the Browns, obviously they're not just, if they really wanted him, like had to have him, couldn't miss on him, they probably would have tried to move up a little bit too, just to make sure they got him. They didn't. They stayed where they were. They let other players fall to them instead. And there was another name on the board that I was very excited for. And it was a wide receiver, and his name is Malik Washington. And the Browns turned in the card, and they drafted a wide receiver. And it was not Malik Washington. At pick 156 in the fifth round, the Cleveland Browns picked Jamari Thrash, the wide receiver from Louisville. So I owe Jamari Thrash an apology. I owe Browns fans who follow us on social media an apology because I reacted emotionally as a fan, like a lot of people did. I was not alone in this. I was kind of commiserating with other Browns fans at the same time without taking the time to step back and go through this logically. And the initial things, because let me just say this up front, Jamari Thrash is not a wide receiver that I scouted for the Browns. I didn't look into him because I just, I didn't think he was a fit for the Browns. I didn't think he was really in play for them at any point. I felt like if they were going to take a swing at a receiver again, it was going to be in the second or third round. And then once we got past that, I thought, okay, they might be waiting till sixth, seventh round, or they're just going to, you know, Mason Tipton in UDFA, who that kid ended up signing with the New Orleans Saints. So good luck to you, Mason. But in the fifth round, I never thought a wide receiver was what the Browns were going to shoot for. But they go for Jamari Thrash. And the instant things that I start seeing posted about him and, and reading, just doing real quick, like, oh, crap, who's Jamari Thrash? I, I, I know the name. I've, I've listened to a couple scouts about him, but I just haven't paid a ton of attention to him. Oh, boy, looks like he's got speed. Looks like he's got drop issues. Oh, for crying out loud, did we just draft Anthony Schwartz again? That was my initial reaction. And just remembering picking Schwartz over Amon Ross St. Brown was like, oh, my gosh, we just took Thrash over Washington. Did we just do it again? Like I said, Jamari Thrash, I owe him an apology because, man, I really believe I was off base with my initial assessment, and now I'm going to give you a little bit more of the research behind him. Let me be clear, before I get started, Jamari Thrash is not Anthony Schwartz. I was, the whole time after I saw the name pop up on the draft board, I was just picturing all the horror show of Anthony Schwartz in my mind, and then I went and I turned on the tape for Jamari Thrash. His tape and everything from this past year, 2023 at Louisville. And immediately, I forgot all about Anthony Schwartz. So let's talk about Jamari Thrash because this kid is kind of a dog. So let's break him down. Jamari Thrash, six feet tall, 188 pounds. He's 23 years old and he will turn 24 in December during the season. So this is the second year in a row now that we've seen Andrew Barry draft an older wide receiver prospect that... Kind of goes against the young breakout philosophy, but again, that COVID season has impacted that picked age range these last couple seasons, and we've already talked about that. So uh, Jamari Thrash is from LaGrange, Georgia. He spent his first four seasons in college at Georgia State. He didn't really play until his third season, where he had 32 receptions for 452 yards and three touchdowns, and then he came back again in his fourth season, and that's where he broke out, I would say. 61 catches, 1,122 yards, and seven touchdowns. It was the best season of his career in college. He transferred after 2022 to go to Louisville, where he put up 63 receptions, 858 yards, and six touchdowns here in 2023. He, uh, in 2022, that 1,100-yard season, he earned first-team All-Sun Belt awards, 
And in 2023, he earned second team all ACC awards. In his first ever game with Louisville here in 2020, or just now in 2023, Jamari Thrash caught seven passes for 88 yards and two touchdowns to help the Cardinals beat none other than Georgia Tech, the team he had just transferred from. So that was, I thought that was an interesting stat. Pretty funny to see. Some measurables here about Jamari Thrash. 446 speed. Immediately, he's not Anthony Schwartz. Anthony Schwartz was 425. This guy's 446. Again, four four fours are not slow, guys. I, I know that, you know, these guys gotta get into the four threes. Yeah, they're they're speedsters. If you get into the four twos, you're elite level speedsters. Four fours, you're I would say average wide receiver speed, which again, wide receivers are fast, so it's not like you're slow. You get into like the four fives, four sixes. Now your speed might be a bit of a concern. Four four six isn't bad. It's not elite. It's not bad. It's average wide receiver in my opinion. He had a one five four ten yard split, thirty four inch vertical, ten foot broad jump, seven one six three cone. Now here from his NFL draft profile, the pros of Jamari Thrash: footwork and early stage smooth and sudden. He's able to rip off route cuts at tight angles. Possesses a second gear for mid-route separation. Above average ball tracking and pace adjustment to bring in the deep balls. Does a nice job of uncovering during quarterback scramble mode. I've seen this a few times from a couple scouting people talking about Jamari Thrash. Again, this is a fifth-year senior, played five years in college. He is a more of a veteran receiver than a 20, 21-year-old coming out after his second season in college or whatever of, of playing meaningful snaps. So Jamari Thrash understands very well the scramble drill. And that is crucial. That is one of the things that popped off the, the tape to me. When the quarterback gets in trouble, when the quarterback's extending plays, Jamari Thrash has an instinct and an understanding of where to go, how to get open, and how to help out his quarterback make a play in the scramble drill. When you've got a guy like Deshaun Watson who is very good at extending plays, fixing broken plays, making something out of nothing, you need a guy who can excel in the scramble drill. It just reminds me so much of the, the one play that always stands out to me is I think it was against maybe the Ravens when Deshaun Watson came back in 2022. He was scrambling, moving out to the right sideline, trying to extend the play, and he throws the ball down to the end zone, just blows it straight past Michael Woods well over his head and out of bounds. And he's trying to tell Michael Woods, who's a six-round rookie, at the time, he's trying to tell Woods, hey, like when, when I'm scrambling out here, man, you got to find, like, you got to get to the open area. You got to know where I'm trying to go. And of course, there was no chemistry there. There's no rapport. So the whole thing was just kind of a, that was just a throwaway play. But a guy like Jamari Thrash would probably be able to understand, I know where I need to be for my quarterback on the move right here. So just another example of why I really like this for Jamari Thrash. So we move into the weaknesses for Jamari. Catch base gets snatched up due to a lack of play strength. The 188 is a, a knock on him. I see a lot of places. He's tall, but he's slight. He's pretty thin. He loses focus when dealing with contact inside the route. He allows throws to get on top of him and turn into drops. Lacks hand strength to finish catches through contact. A couple more stats. Yes, eight drops in 2023. He had 11.4% drop rate. That was among the highest in the entire draft class. Not good. Definitely a stat that I do not like to see with a wide receiver that we're bringing into the team. I watched a play the other night where he he was running a route. He offset his defender, broke off wide open to the corner of the end zone. Quarterback throws the ball, hits him right, right in the hands, right in stride, and he double caught it. He caught it. He scored the touchdown, but it was the bobble on the wide open placement that had me like, ooh, dude, just, just clean catch that. You know, I think that might be a focus drop. There's some concentration issues. But again, you know, he he had the ball, and I think he was just making sure his feet were in, lost concentration, dropped the ball, recaught it, scored the touchdown. But it's stuff like that that leads to these drops that he suffers from. He did have a 2.35 yards per route run. That's a great number. We like guys that are over, definitely over 2. Over 2.25 is, is where I want you to be. Thrash, he's, you know, 2.35. He's over that mark. That's good. His A dot, 11.6 yards. He uh, ran 340 snaps out wide, just 41 in the slot. So he was 89, almost 90% of his routes were run on the outside. He's primarily an outside receiver. Now, he's not your uh, what it, not your X receiver. He'd be more of your Y. He can move into the slot. 
but I think that he's going to be a good opposite field player across from Amari Cooper. So we got Amari and Jamari. And I think that his skill set is along the Marquise Goodwin role. So if you think what the Browns wanted Marquise Goodwin to do last year, now Marquise was a little bit more of like the burner, but it's not so much about the straight line speed. It's more about your deep ball awareness and prowess. And that is something that Jamari Thrash is good at. And the thing with Jamari Thrash that I was watching, and I'll keep talking about some of his stuff here, but just watching the tape on Jamari Thrash, I said that it made me forget about Anthony Schwartz immediately. Jamari Thrash can freaking run routes. Now, is he the best route runner in the entire class? No, of course not. He's, he's a fifth round pick. But if you remember Anthony Schwartz, super fast. Just put him in a straight line and let him go. Just don't throw the ball to him because he's not going to catch it. Jamari Thrash can run routes. The dude's got, he's got good moves. He knows how to set up a defender. He knows how to make a guy go one way while he's going another. And I was, I came away from the, the tape actually pretty impressed. I was like, I'm, I'm glad that the Browns got this guy. Because while I don't expect Jamari Thrash to ever be the number one alpha dog receiver for the Browns. Again, we talked about that on previous episodes. That's not what you're trying to do in the fifth round. What you want to do is find a guy who can be a reliable rotational or wide receiver three for your team. A guy that you can put on the field and you know, if we need him, we got him. And he's going to make a play. He might not ever be the first read on a play. Or we might. the only time he is a first read is when we drop a play for him. But Jamari Thrash could easily, I could easily see him being that guy because, again, like I said at the top of this, he's kind of a dog. He does, if you watch him in Louisville, he's got a my ball mentality. Now, it's not my ball in terms of contested catch because he kind of sucks at contested catches. I'm not going to lie. That is not his strong suit. But when I say my ball mentality, it's, it's the mentality of throw me the ball, I'll make a play. And he does. And he makes plays. And he makes guys miss. And he's not bad after the catch. He's not the doesn't have the most yak yards. He's not the best after the catch receiver, but he has the ability. He has the ability to take a quick slant to the house if he gets past the guy and turns on the jet. So uh, overall, I, I like what I was seeing from Jamari Thrash. 418 yards after the catch, just nine yards behind Marvin Harrison Jr., just if you want to put that into context for 2023. Here's the contested catch, just three of 19 in 2023, just a 15.8% contested catch rate. So he is not a 50-50 ball receiver. That is going to be Cedric Tillman. Again, Tillman and Thrash have very complementary skill sets. They don't overlap each other very much at all, which is cool, which is good. We didn't want, you know, two receivers that did exactly the same thing. And you're like, well, which one do I use in this situation? We've got specific guys for specific things. He did have a 104.9 passer rating when targeted. That's pretty good. I like to see that. So if we go and we look at draft buzz scouting, they rated him 84% in short area, 89% in the intermediate, which is huge. Talk about this all the time with receivers. If you can win consistently in the intermediate area of the field, you're going to earn, you're going to earn targets. You're going to be a quarterback's best friend because the NFL is playing 70% zone on average right now. 89% in the intermediate. I like that a lot. 84% deep. I thought that was a pretty good number. Now, not a very good run blocker on just 65% score there. And his hands got a 66% because of the drops in that issue. So again, good speed, not elite speed, good speed, good route runner can make, I mean, he can run the routes. He, he's got a route tree. Now, is, does it need work? Of course it needs work, but he's not coming in super raw where he's got to work on everything, you know, to, to get anywhere. Like the dude com is coming in with a route running regimen. Got to fix the drops. Got to clean that stuff up if you're going to be able to contribute for the Cleveland Browns. So here is what Draft Buzz had to say. Jamari Thrash enters the NFL draft as a receiver with a polished route tree and a knack for finding soft spots in zone coverage. Everything I already talked about. His ability to execute sharp cuts and showcase reliable hands makes him a threat on short to intermediate routes. With his demonstrative footwork and ability to make quick cuts thrash can create separation against man coverage making him a viable in the slot viable option in the slot or on the outside his route running savvy combined with an instinctual understanding of defensive schemes allows him to be a consistent target however 
Thrasher's game does come with limitations, particularly in his downfield speed, where his time speed doesn't show, and ability to contest catches against more physically imposing defenders. His lack of elite burst and play strength could hinder his effectiveness in press coverage at the next level. Despite these concerns, Thrash's versatility and football IQ position him as a promising prospect for teams looking to bolster their wide receiving core. His ability to operate both inside and outside gives offensive coordinators flexibility in play calling, while his hands and route running precision ensure he can be a reliable chain mover. Thrash's performance in scramble drill situations and his knack for uncovering against sorry, for his knack for uncovering against broken plays add another layer to his on-field value. That's the scramble drill thing I was talking about. Overall, Thrash projects as a scheme versatile receiver capable of contributing early in his career, particularly in systems that value precision route running and spatial awareness. Gee, whose offense does that sound like? His draft stock might be tempered by physical and athletic limitations, but his skill set offers enough upside to warrant consideration on day three, and that's where the Browns got him. So I started it by saying I'm sorry to Jamari Thrash, and I will wrap this thing up by saying I, I owe everybody an apology for my initial reaction to Thrash because I don't want to put the failures of Anthony Schwartz or even David Bell, and I can't include anything with Cedric Tillman. It's only been one year. So Schwartz... The, the, the downfall, whatever you want to call it, of, of David Bell, I cannot project those onto Jamari Thrash. Jamari Thrash is his own receiver. I cannot tell Anthony or uh, Andrew Barry, don't draft another receiver because you've missed on a couple. You have to keep taking swings at this position if you're going to, like this says, bolster your wide receiving core. You've already got a Murray Cooper. You got your Alpha. You got your one. You got Jerry Judy. You got a top number two receiver who could still move into that number one receiver spot. You've still got Elijah Moore. You've got Cedric Tillman. And now we've got Jamari Thrash. And again, go watch the tape. Go watch the tape. I liked his presence. I liked his confidence. I liked his leadership on the field. He just looked like a dude that a quarterback can rely on. And that shows up a lot in a lot of his scouting. And I, I came away impressed. I really did. Again, the expectations are develop into a consistent, reliable, contributing number three option for the Browns offense. And I will be very happy. And I think Jamari Thrash can be exactly that. I like his leadership. Like I said, I like his understanding on the football field. I saw multiple places cite his football IQ as a very good pro for him. Fifth year senior, he should know what he's doing out there. And when you watch the tape, you can tell he does. This episode is brought to you by Danger Coffee. Browns fans, we talk about how Danger Coffee is made free from mold toxins that are in 45% of the world's coffee, but that's not all that Danger Coffee has to offer. Mineral and nutrient deficiencies are a big deal. They make you feel sick, tired, stressed, and they can give you brain fog. These deficiencies negatively affect your immune system, your digestion, sleep, metabolism. Have you ever wondered why you get an initial burst from your coffee? but then you get that little crash not long after, Danger Coffee's patent-pending process remineralizes your body with more than 50 trace minerals and electrolytes, leaving you more energized, engaged, powerful. These micronutrients enter the cells to boost performance. They bind to toxins to provide detoxification support. I know that sounds like a lot, but the bottom line, guys, is minerals matter. And most of us really don't get enough of them on a daily basis. Danger Coffee delivers micronutrients, plus it gives you access to the minerals you already have. Head to DangerCoffee.com, use our code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, for 10% off your order. And that code can be used over and over, so you get 10% off every order you make using code DOGS. It's time to start every day off with a cup of coffee that gets you going and actually keeps you going. DangerCoffee.com. Code dogs. All right, so we got three players to go. We are moving into the sixth round pick, 206. Another player that I mocked to the Browns a couple times because I really, really, really love this pick. Not going to lie, guys. I love Mike Hall. I love Zach Zinter in the third. I'm very optimistic about Jamari Thrash. My favorite pick for the place we got the guy for what we needed for who he is in this entire draft 
is Nathaniel Watson out of Mississippi State, the inside linebacker at pick 206 in the sixth round. Nathaniel Watson, six foot two, 233 pounds. He's 23 years old and he will turn 24 before the season. So he's an older prospect, but Andrew Barry did not care. And neither do I, because this is a dude that wanted for the Browns. If they made it this far into the draft, they didn't take a linebacker yet. And this guy was still available. I wanted to come away with Nathaniel Watson and we did. Now, Watson didn't play much his first two seasons in 2018 and 2019. He played more in 2020, but then in 2021, he had a breakout game against none other than Alabama, where he had 16 tackles, one tackle for loss, and one sack. 2021 season, he finished with 83 tackles, six TFLs, and five sacks. 2022, this dude continues his ascension. He gets his first ever interceptions. And over the course of the season, he tallies up 113 tackles, 12 tackle for loss, six sacks. He earned second team all SEC honors. And then in 2023, he comes back for his last season in the SEC in college at Mississippi State. And he freaking dominated the SEC. 137 total tackles, 13 tackle for loss, 10 sacks, and another interception. He got first-team All-SEC honors, and Nathaniel Watson was named SEC Defensive Player of the Year. And yes, now the Cleveland Browns have two reigning Defensive Players of the Year on their roster. Steelers fans, cry harder. The NFL Draft prospect profile for Nathaniel Watson, the pros, posted 31 tackles for loss and 21 sacks since the start of the 2021 season. He thuds blocks with heavy hands to stack and stay separated. Patient not to overcommit while reading and flowing to the football. Good feel for getting home when operating as a blitzer. Poised as a box tackler leading to lower number of missed tackles. Squares ball carries with good pop and wrap approach. Weaknesses. Posted just 35 solo tackles out of 137 total tackles in 2023. Stacks blockers, but is a step slow shedding them for tackles. Loses ground when the pursuit extends in space. Tight hips hinder him from sinking and changing direction fluidly. Coverage liability with limited athleticism and field awareness. Again, this is your middle inside presence linebacker. I'm not overly concerned about coverage skills with him, just like I didn't really care about coverage with Anthony Walker, and I don't care about coverage with Jordan Hicks. That's not what I that's not what you guys are on the field to really do anyway. What you are on the field to do is to stuff the line and make tackles and get get behind the line if you can, and that's what this kid does so well, and I'm so pumped that we have him. Draft Buzz Scouting rated Nathaniel Watson a 99 on tackling. A 90 freaking nine. I'm excited to watch this kid play. He got an 80% on pass rush, 80% run defense, 70% in coverage. I'll take those scores every day for a six round pick that is eventually going to be my starting middle linebacker. And I'd really believe Nathaniel Watson is going to be the starting middle linebacker at some point. And that, maybe not this year because we've got Hicks and everything like that. We'll see what Devin Bush can bring for the future for this guy. I just, you can tell I'm pretty hyped about him. So draft buzz scouting his pros has enough hustle and athleticism to make plays in the flat against running backs. He lacks height, but has the vertical and timing to knock away passes when approaching the quarterback. Watson shows good quickness off the line of scrimmage and flashes the violent hands to win around the edge. He's an instinctive and active chase and tackle for three will linebacker with the speed to go sideline to sideline. He takes excellent angles. He also has an innate sense for shooting gaps as a run defender. That's awesome. Big aggressive hitter who can lay the wood has good awareness to quickly locate the ball, keeping his eyes up and on point. Watson combines the athleticism of a chase and tackle defender and the toughness and physicality of a classic 4-3 Mike linebacker. Thickly built with classic linebacker size. How long have we been saying, guys, just go out there and get us a big, beefy, you know, your traditional type middle linebacker? We got him. Adequate strength and the smarts to cover up his athletic shortcomings in the right scheme. Jim Schwartz is going to love you. Weaknesses, not a sudden or quick twitch athlete, will never be the strongest player on the field and can struggle to shed from different angles. He's not long and his frame is just about maxed out. Can be too hesitant when Watson doesn't find the ball immediately. Again, pros and cons with every prospect. Sixth round pick for this guy. I'm very, you guys can tell. I'm excited. I'm enamored to have him. Like I said, based on the position of need, we needed a linebacker based on where we got him. We got him in the sixth round. Based on his production profile, 
Defensive Player of the Year in the SEC, first team all SEC, 137 tackles. What was it? 12 tackle for loss or something like that. I got to find my notes here. Um, 12 ta- or 13 tackle for loss, 10 sacks, and an interception last year. In the sixth round, sign me up for Nathaniel freaking Watson. So now we enter the final round of the draft, and this is probably the most excited I've ever been for a seventh round pick. The Cleveland Browns at pick 227 select Miles Harden, the cornerback out of South Dakota. Let's talk about Miles Harden because this one, on at first glance, was like, okay, we took a depth corner, whatever, we'll see if he makes the team. Researched him, looked into him, said, oh damn, oh damn, what did we just get? Five foot 11, 195 pounds, just 22 years old. He's from Miramar, Florida. In 2021, he made his college debut with four tackles and two interceptions. 2021 ended with a leg injury. Prior to that, he was the team's fourth leading tackler. 2022, played just six games because he re-injured the same leg. And when he did, he was at that time the third leading tackler on his team. And he was actually named all MVFC and Hero Sports Sophomore sophomore All-American, even in just six games that year. Senior year. He was in 2023 named a team captain. He played in all 13 games, 58 tackles, seven pass breakups, and one interception. Got named all MVFC again, was a first team All American. We just got a first team All American in the seventh round. Pretty cool. He got invited to the East West Shrine game and the NFL Combine. NFL draft profile for Miles Harden. Harden's game is filled with competitiveness and aggression, but missing any semblance of finesse. He stands out with his field awareness and zone coverages and his physicality at the catch point and against the run. He's capable as a man defender, but figures to take on some water against NFL wideouts with above average speed. He's cut low with good gather quickness and fluidity and lateral transitions. He is an A plus tackler whose blend of toughness and field vision could see teams push him into a role as a big nickel or safety. So the pros, tapered build with good musculation throughout, low cut with good bend and fluid change of direction, good eye balance between quarterback and receiver, excellent recognition of route development around him in zone, ruins contested catches with elevated physicality into receivers, hits and tackles like a safety with good chest up, wrap up finishes. Weaknesses, lacks ideal arm strength to play on the outside, struggled through injuries for the better part of 2021 and 2022, Again, the same leg. Has some issues playing with patience to match clever press releases. Step up in competition will test him in man coverage. Average acceleration to close out separation at the break points. Moving over to draft buzz scouting. His tackling was rated 85%. Run defense 80%. Coverage 84% overall. 71% score in zone. 75% in man. They say Miles Harden enters the NFL draft as a battle-tested corner with significant reps in zone coverage. His football IQ and ability to read the quarterback's eyes allow him to jump routes effectively, making him a fit for schemes that value cerebral players with zone instincts. Uh Huh? Yeah, NFL. However, concerns about his arm length and durability could limit his draft stock and role as teams may hesitate to trust him on the boundary against the NFL's elite receivers. Harden's tackling prowess and his physicality suggest a potential shift to a safety or a slot corner at the NFL level where his skill set can be maximized. His college tape shows a player who excels in contact situations and is not afraid to mix it up in the box or on the edge. Characteristics that are prized in a nickelback or safety hybrid. NFL teams will appreciate his versatility and hard-nosed approach to the game. Traits that can make him a core special teams player while he develops further defensively. In summary... Miles Harden may not fit the mold of a prototypical NFL outside corner, but his ability to play in space coupled with his aggressive tackling makes him a valuable commodity. With teams valuing adaptability and toughness, Harden's capacity to fill multiple roles could see him making an immediate impact, particularly on teams that emphasize a physical brand of football, a la the Cleveland freaking Browns and Jim Schwartz. So i very excited, and I know... Again, I get it. Seventh round pick, Josh, what do you just calm down? You, can't, you don't have to be excited about everybody. Yeah, you know what? I could be excited about everybody. And I'm excited about Miles Harden. I talked already. I said four out of the six picks we made, I can see being either solid, consistently contributing players on the Browns team or potentially starters. And that was the fourth one right there. You got Mike Hall, Zach Zinter, 
Nathaniel Watson and Miles Harden in the seventh round. I I think that this guy could be a a quality role depth rotational guy at the cornerback position, and I think he could even develop into a starter if things go well for him. He's got that potential, so that's awesome. We'll move on real quick. One last guy to talk about, the last seventh-round pick the Browns made, pick 243, Jawan Briggs, defensive tackle out of Cincinnati. So as I mentioned, the second defensive tackle the Browns took, they bookend the draft with the defensive interior. They take a lean, smaller-sized pass rush expert, whatever you want to call him, specialist at the top, and they take a beefier run stuffer like Jawan Briggs from Cincinnati at the very end to pick 243, like I said. So Jawan Briggs, six foot one, 313 pounds, 22 years old. He'll turn 23 right before the season. And he's actually from Cincinnati, Ohio. So again, we started the draft with a Cleveland defensive tackle. And we ended the draft all the way down south in Cincinnati with a defensive tackle. Started his college career at Virginia, played 240 snaps, 247 snaps as a freshman. He had decent production. Nothing crazy for those first two seasons at Virginia. He transferred to Cincinnati in 2021, played all 14 games, had 39 tackles, 15 run stops, 23 pressures with three sacks. 2022, he played in 12 games with 52 tackles, 28 run stops, 19 pressures, and five sacks. 2022 was Jawan Briggs' best season in college. Again, let me read those again. 12 games, 52 tackles. 28 run stops, 19 pressures, five sacks. And here in 2023, he played 12 games again, 25 tackles, 14 run stops, 15 pressures, and two sacks. So production came down a little bit, but still very effective. NFL draft profile, squatty interior defender with short arms and a lack of ideal scheme fit. He won't disrupt as a gap shooter and isn't long enough to control blockers as a two gapper. Briggs isn't sudden off the snap, but does play with good lateral quickness to hunt and tackle runners down the line. He does a decent job of utilizing hand fighting to knock a blocker's hands off of him, but he's more likely to stay engaged early on than find quick wins. Briggs is active and plays with good hustle, but might not have the traits or one positional advantage to stand out. His pros, team captain and durable multi-year starter. Plays with secondary effort to pressure play-extending quarterbacks. Mm, That's pretty good. We got a lot of those in the AFC North now. Let's see. An excellent short area hustle helps him rally to ball carriers, plays with enough anchor to constrict gap against single blocks. Weaknesses. He has short arms and lacks initial jump to get on top of pass protection quickly. Unable to create enough separation to clear block engagement. Struggles keeping pads square to move blocks and gets washed away on cutbacks, and he doesn't possess traits of true one or two gap defender. Moving over to draft buzz, scouting, Combines excellent power with initial quickness, but one of his best attributes are his violent hands, which Briggs uses with impressive precision. His hand use is excellent. He's strong in the upper body and consistently swats away blockers. He has a compact build, but he is a crafty edge player who is very good against the run. Briggs sets the edge and effectively wards off blocks with a strong core, powerful limbs, and natural leverage. I like all that. He's very instinctive when it comes to countering and solid with overall hand usage. Strong tackler, has good power in hands, can anchor, shed, and chase. He's a high motor player. He shows good enough hand use as well as a tight spin move to win as an edge rusher. Hmm. So interesting to see that while he is more of that interior, you know, classical interior defensive lineman, he's also versatile and can be put on the edge as well. Weaknesses, while he's powerfully built, his short arms, again, we got those damn short arms, Javon. He's got short arms, allow blockers to get into his body. He's stiff as an athlete. He lacks the flexibility to truly threaten the edge. Briggs doesn't show much in the way of dynamic change in direction ability on counter moves, and he also has a limited repertoire of pass rushing moves. One other note on him that I found, Jawan Briggs did 39 reps on the bench press. That was 99th percentile. That's a monster. That is one strong man. So Jawan Briggs... Seventh round pick, again, I'm not sitting here saying that he's going to develop into some starter or anything like that, but grabbing a guy like this with his physical attributes and what he's able to do in certain, you know, situations and things like that, it's a great, it's a, this is a great calculated flyer pick for the Browns to try to bring in another defensive lineman, give them, you know, some ability to battle it out in camp 
And honestly, Jawan Briggs probably makes the practice squad at the end of camp, would be my guess. And you've got a good developmental defensive tackle on your practice squad. And it just gives you a little more depth and flexibility moving into next year because you still got, you know, Quentin Jefferson and Mo Hurst are on one year deals. Now you got Tomlinson and Shelby Harris is on Shelby Harris on a two year deal. And then you've got Ika still on his rookie contract. And of course, Michael Hall. So the Browns are just giving themselves more, more quality options to operate with moving forward at defensive tackle. And that wraps up the NFL draft for the Cleveland Browns in 2024. Again, very excited about this draft class. I think there is a ton of future potential that we just brought into Cleveland through the draft. And I'm very excited to see how it all plays out. Like I said at the top of the show, I'm just going to mention the UDFAs that we signed so far. And I will do a second in-depth episode on the undrafted free agents later this week. But <laughs> the UDFA market started off with two guys that we Mock to the Browns heavily. Running back Aiden Robbins from BYU is a guy. I'm pretty sure it was Kenny Mack detailed him extensively when we did our first mock draft. Or no, when we did our players the Browns have met with and could or should draft. And we talked about Aiden Robbins being either a seventh round pick or potentially a priority UDFA, which is exactly where we got him. So very excited. He's a big, big bodied running back that I think could actually make some good noise this summer at training camp. And I've seen people already say, oh yeah, he'll be good for the practice squad. Maybe he'll push John Kelly off. Aiden Robbins is the type of running back that if he comes in and does what he can do best, I think he pushes for a roster spot. We'll see. I'm not saying that, you know, I project that to happen for sure, but he definitely got the potential. And then the second guy I really want to key in on, I can't wait to talk about him on the next show, offensive guard Javian Cohen from Miami. You guys, I did several episodes talking about Javian Cohen and how I thought he is a perfect offensive guard for the Browns to target in the mid to maybe like third to fifth round. If he falls into that range somewhere, the Browns need to try to get him, maybe move into the fourth round to draft him. The freaking dude goes all the way through the draft undrafted and we sign him right away. We get Javian Cohen as an undrafted free agent. And that's another guy that I re- that I do project Javian Cohen to make the 53 man roster in the fall. So I, I'm very excited to see what he can do. And just another note, we talked about Zach Zinter being the right guard. Throughout college, JV and Cohen is primarily left guard. So maybe we're seeing the Browns find guys that they're thinking this could be the future of our line. We'll see what happens. But if you've watched this show for any length of time, you know I've been very high on JV and Cohen. So I was surprised to see him going drafted. Every pick we got to, six, fifth round, sixth round, seven, seven, I'm going, Cohen's on the board, draft Cohen. And they just didn't. Well, we got him anyway. So that's pretty awesome. We also signed offensive lineman Lorenzo Thompson from Rhode Island, linebacker Winston Reed from Weber State, safety Chris Edmonds from Arizona State, cornerback Deshaun Gales from South Dakota State, wide receiver Amarian Brown from South Carolina, and center Jalen Sundell from North Dakota State. Oh, sorry, there's one more. Tight end Trayton Welch from Wyoming. So what is that? One, three, I don't know. We're, we're close to 10 UDFA signings so far. And there'll probably be a few more. We'll see what happens. I'm going to let the UDFA market play out a little bit and do an episode on that, like I said, later in the week. So stay tuned for that. But there's your draft recap so far for the Cleveland Browns in 2024. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. Who was your favorite pick? Number one thing I want to know from everybody watching this, just go to the comments and tell me who was your favorite pick for the Browns this year. And then I also want to know who was your least favorite pick. Do you have a least favorite pick? Do you have a pick that you wish they wouldn't have made because you wanted somebody else at that spot? I want to hear it all from you guys. Let me know your thoughts. It was such a fun weekend watching the draft, following along, and everybody's got prospects they like. Everybody's got prospects they want, and we don't all get who we want. So I want to hear from you guys and how you think this is all going to play out. But again, like the video subscribe to the channel, tap the notification bell so you don't miss anything new. We are going to do a live show later this week with the whole crew, breaking down more of the the Browns draft class and just getting Blake's thoughts and Justin's thoughts on everybody coming into Cleveland and what we think about it all. So again, I appreciate you guys going through this with me and I hope you learned something. I hope you came away excited and pumped like me. And again, if not, let me know why. Want to hear it. Till I talk to you guys again, let's go Browns. 
Thanks for listening to another episode of The Dogs Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at The Dogs Podcast. Get your thoughts on the show at thedogspodcast.com.